So if our Lord, our God, Lord, how amazing you are. Lord, I know that I have no right to be up here, that I'm a sinner who is saved through your grace, Lord. But Lord, I just pray that the message I have be the message that someone here needs to hear, Lord. That the words not be my own, but be yours. And that, Lord, through me, that they may see you. We love you, Lord, and thank you for loving us. In your name I pray, amen. 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 So this morning, I want to start with a question. Have you ever been asked to do something that just didn't make sense to you? I mean, like, someone asked you to do something, and you're like, I, I, I don't know why I need to do this. And I know for me, when I was younger, maybe you were asked the same question or asked to do the same thing. But when I was younger, I was asked to do this. And no, it wasn't sleep. I was a pro at sleeping. But it was to make my bed. My mom would always ask me, she'd say, honey, I need you to make your bed. Anybody else have the same mom like me who would make you make your bed? And, and for me, I never really understood, you know? Because, like, I'm going to make it, but it's just going to get dirty again. It's just going to get unmade. And if you were a sleeper like me, when you got done, it didn't look like this. You know, we're just like nicely out to the side and you just slipped out of bed. But I found out as a young age that as a sleeper, I was like a pro wrestler. Because this isn't my bed. I got this off of Google. But when I got done, you know, the blankets there, the pillows there, and you're upside down and you, you know. And I, when I wake up, like my, my bed was a mess. And I couldn't understand, you know, why, why would I have to make my bed? Because the next day, I'm just going to have to make it again and again and again. And I just could never understand why I had to make my bed. But you know what? I, I, I hate to say it, but my mom was right. There was a point to making my bed. And I want to share with you uh, an article from the Huffington Post. And they quote and they say, as Charles Duhigg notes in his fascinating book, The Power of ha Habits, this is what the book says. It says, making your bed every morning is correlated with better productivity, a greater sense of well-being, just for making your bed, and stronger skills at sticking with a budget just for making your bed. But, but they continue to say, making your bed is what he calls a keystone habit, something that kickstarts a pattern of good behavior. And since it happens at the very beginning of the day, you're apt to make better decisions for the remainder of the day thanks to your bed-making routine. I guess, I guess my mom was right. But the article continues. It doesn't start here. A Navy SEAL by the name of William H. McCarvin a commander of the forces that led the raid to kill Osama, Osama bin Laden. He echoed the same thing in his 2014 commencement speech at the University of Texas. When he was addressing the, the graduates, he said, if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. If you make your bed every morning, you have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. But the article continues and says, if success and productivity aren't enough for you to make your bed, it turns out making your bed is also one of the most effective and easiest triggers of happiness, just for making your bed. Uh, Gurchin Rubin, in his best-selling offer and happiness researcher says, when I was researching my book on happiness, this, this was the number one most impactful change the, that people brought up over and over. So I guess my mom was right. There is a point to making your bed and you know, any parents here you're looking at your kids like you hear that. but. You know, so I guess there is a point to making our bed, but my question this morning is, has God ever asked you to do something that didn't make sense? Or maybe even more, maybe you are in a place in your life, you have a job, you're a situation that just doesn't make sense. But you know, God has called you to be there, but it just doesn't make sense. And this morning, if that is you, you know, you're not alone. There's a man in the Bible by the name of Philip who understands exactly what you're going through. So turn with me to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 26. Or no, Acts chapter 8. I'm sorry. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. 
Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. And when you guys get there, give me a hearty amen. 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 <clears throat> so I want you to see something here because God asked Philip to do something that just didn't make sense. So starting in verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So I just want to stop here. So one day God tells him, I want you to go down this road. And interesting enough, the road that God wanted him to go down, it says it was a desert road, but it was actually a, des a desolate road. And barely anybody would travel down it. And what you've got to understand is during this time, to go down roads, to travel was dangerous because of robbers and thieves. So one day God comes up to him and says, I need you to go to this road. And he doesn't tell him why. So to make this real for us today, that's like one morning you wake up and God says, hey, I need you to get in your car, go down 67 towards Glen Rose, and go. It doesn't, doesn't tell you why, it doesn't tell you anything, it just says get in your car and go. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but I like to have information, right? I like to be like, okay, so I'm going to go down 67, all right, where am I going to stop, where am I going to go? But what happens? Philip goes. No questions. He gets up. And he goes, so continue with me to verse 27. <clears throat> and it says, So he started out on his way, and he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, which means, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. And just an interesting little nugget. The way the Ethiopians' government ran is they had kings and queens. The kings were believed to be deities, to be gods. So they were kind of like the face figure, but the queens were in the backgrounds, and they're the ones who actually ran the country. So just an interesting, you know, just an interesting nugget, no, no theological point there, but that's, that's, how the, that's how the country was ran. And it says, this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Why had he gone to Jerusalem? To worship, to worship God. But let's continue in verse 28. And it says, and on his way home, was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet, the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near. And, and I want to stop right here. And I want to ask you, has God ever asked you to do something that just doesn't make sense? Because I, mean, I want you to imagine, here is Philip. And, you know, he tells him to go on the road, and he sees this group of Ethiopians. And to go from where they're going was a long journey so during that time, that would have meant that they were on a convoy. They were in a convoy because they'd have to go in groups for safety against criminals and thieves. So here you're Philip, and you're walking down, and you see this whole group of Ethiopians. And, and I want you to notice one thing. This is two chapters before Peter has his dream about giving the gospel to the Gentiles. And Ethiopi Ethiopians were... For lack of better word, Af Africans or Ethiopians, they were of darker skin color. They were Gentiles. And so to do this, this was Philip getting out of sight of his comfort zone. And when, when, I, when I read this story, it reminds me of a mission story, a missionary story. When I was little, I, I, I heard, and it's a story about a family. They're living in Africa, and you know, they're working on this, in this small village, and they have a young son, about nine years old, and one day, you know, they're, they're out in this house, and by the house they have some trees. And, you know, in Africa it's hot, so the trees, the sun always loved to play. That was his favorite spot. And so he's out playing amongst the trees, and his dad comes out, and he sees his dad, and he's happy. He waves to his dad, and as soon as his dad walks out, his dad says, son, to the ground now. And without even skipping a beat, the son falls down to his hand and feet. And the, son, and, the, and the father said, son, crawl to me quickly. So the son starts to crawl. And he says, now, son, get up and run to me. So the son ran, ran, ran until he, fell, until he fell into his father's arms. And when he looks back, he sees this. In the tree. Now, I don't know if it was actually that snake. I got that off of Google. But... The story said that it was a poisonous snake that was ready to strike. And if the son had asked the dad, why do I, I like these clothes, I don't want to get them dirty. If he had questioned the father, 
he could have died. And the story came out and said, just like with the son following the father, how much more should we follow God, our heavenly father? And you know, first when I read this story, it brings out to me that God's greatest desire for us is to be willing to go when he says go. And I know in my life, I miss so many opportunities so many opportunities because God says, go talk to them, go do this, go do this, and I hesitate. And I'm like, God, well, I don't know the full information. I don't know. Are you sure you want me to do this? But when God tells you to go, what are we to do? We're to go. And this is what the, the greatest need that God is looking for his people is for us to be willing to go where God wants us to go. But I want us to point something else out because in this story, at this moment, Philip is getting outside of a comfort zone. Because to this time, the gospel was for the Jews and the Samaritans. That's who they were preaching it to. And here, before Peter even had the dream, Philip is going to a Gentile. He's going to Ethiopian. And he's getting outside of his comfort zone. And this is something, I, I don't know about you, but this is something that I struggle with because we like our comfort zones, don't we? We like our routines. We, you know, we, we, like, we like this comfort zone. But you know, God can only work outside of our comfort zone, can't he? It's when we're in our comfort zone that God can't work. And as I read this story, it, it, it almost slaps me in the face is, am I too comfortable where I'm living? Do I need to become uncomfortable for God? And, and to be honest with you, if right now, if you feel God has been calling you to do something that is outside your comfort zone, maybe it's, you know, pass out literature, maybe it's just to talk to your neighbors about God or just to talk to your neighbors, maybe it's to help in the church or to be active or do, do something. If God's called you to do something and it's outside of your comfort zone, I want you to know that I understand. Uh, if you looked in your bulletin, you know, every Monday morning from 5 to 7, I start a prayer group. And to be honest with you, before I started the prayer group, a month before, God told me, Austin, you need to be praying. And, and I got this, this impression that I needed to do something like this. But can I be honest with you? It was outside my comfort zone. Because for one, I mean, Monday's my day off. And the idea of waking up at 4.30 in the morning on my day off sounded like insanity. And even more, to pray for two hours, can, can, I, can I be honest with you? Before that time, probably I could count on my fingers of how many times I prayed for two hours straight to God. And to pray for two hours. But what I've learned is when I was willing to get out outside of my comfort zone, that's when God is able to work. And from this, God has created this prayer group and from it, my faith is growing. My trust in God is growing. So in your life right now, if God is calling you to do something that is outside of your comfort zone, learn, if you can learn anything from my mistakes, I say do it. Whatever it may be, whatever God is calling you to do that is outside of your comfort zone, don't hesitate. Go. But let's go back to the story. Let's, let's continue. And we're, we're going back to Acts chapter 8, and we're going to 30 to 35. And it says, Then Philip ran up to the chariot, and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. And the, the man said, How can I, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Verse 32. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shares is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And just to explain, when they were asking about you know, who is the prophet talking about? Even today in the, in the Jewish community, there's two ideas. One is that I, Isaiah was speaking about himself, his struggles. And the other one is that it's the actual country 
of Israel that goes through it. But we know that it's Jesus, right? The man who was brought before like a, a sheep to the slaughter. That's Jesus Christ. And I want you to know something. When Philip went outside of his comfort zone, God had already prepared the way. Because, I mean, what is the chance that the eunuch would be reading the scripture that's all about Jesus? And I want you to notice one, one more thing is when, Jesus, when, when Philip taught the eunuch, he met him where he was. He explained to the, the eunuch what he was struggling with, what he was trying to learn in scripture. He met him there and he walked him forward. And, and as I read this, I just thank God that isn't that the same thing he does for us? He meets us where we are. I mean, it makes me think, I have a little baby brother and we're, there's 18 years difference. He's, he's almost six now. And I remember when I first got to hold him in my arms, you know, he was just this cutest little bundle of baby. And I, I, I was holding him in my arms, but you know, as I was holding him in my arms, I didn't expect to lower him down and have him run around. Why? Because he's a newborn baby. You know, in, this, in the same way, God doesn't expect for us to, as soon as we learn about Jesus, to be running. But he takes us baby steps, and he leads us along our Christian walk. And you know, it's the same thing as a Christian body. Some of you might be runners. Some of us might just be barely able to sit up. We're all in a different walk in life. And just like a baby, how when a baby first begins to move, at first it sits up in its crib, then it, it, then it, or, and then it starts to try to crawl, and then it has like the half crawl. And then I'm, it, I'm pretty sure all babies, they skip walking. Because all of a sudden, like the babies, they, they learn how to, they have their first steps, then they're running. And, but you know, in our Christian walk, it's the same thing. And if we, if we are running, but our brother and sister is barely sitting up, we can't expect for them to be running. We can't expect to be like, hey, what are you doing? Come on, come run with me. Let's, let's do this Christian walk. We need to take them where they are and lead them just as God leads us, baby steps. So as a church, we're all running for Christ. Amen? And you see, it's, it's as a church, as this body of Christ, that we work together to encourage each other. Because, you know, just like when a baby walks, have you ever seen a baby Learn to walk without ever falling. You know, in our Christian walk, if, if any of us expect for us to start our Christian walk and to never fall, we're mistaken. Because just like a baby, we're, in our Christian walk, we're going to fall, we're going to make mistakes, but it's as the body of Christ that God has shown us that we are to encourage each other, to help each other up. If someone's really sitting up, it's, it's our... It's our duty, it's our privilege to help them to start crawling, then to help them to start, <clears throat> start walking, then to help them to start running. And the only way we can do this is as a church if we work together. Because in the church there are no lone rangers. Because we are the body of Christ. And I'd just like to encourage you, if, if you know someone who, who maybe they're, they're struggling just to sit up, just to stand up, that you put them under your wings. If, you're, if, you, if you are running, to help them, to help get them to where you are, but not to stop there, but to continuously grow. Because I don't know about you, but I have a lot to grow. And I praise God because he's working on me every single day, just as he's working on each and every one of you. But let's continue. Let's go back to our story. And we're going to start in verse 36. And it says, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And I, I just, I just want to stop real fast and say, what kind of road were they on? A desert road. You know, I don't believe in luck, or ch luck and chance. It's through God's divine providence that as they were talking, as he found out about Jesus Christ, there was water. What's the chance? It only shows me that God is in control. And then verse 37 says, If you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he gave orders to, the, to stop the chariot. 
Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the, of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. And this is the most amazing thing. I mean, uh, just imagine this moment. You're Philip, and you don't know, you, God tells you to go, and you go, and you see this convoy, and you meet this, this uh, Ethiopian, and you get to tell him about God's word. And this is the most amazing thing, is because before Philip was ever told to go, God was working on this Ethiopian's heart. And you know, in our lives, when God tells us to go, he's not just throwing us in the water and says, try to swim. God provides, provides everything for us. When we are to go, God has already been working on their hearts. Or maybe God's already working on your heart. And the amazing thing is he stops, and he, as, we, as we saw before, there's body water, and he gets baptized. And then what happens next? Philip gets taken away from the Lord or t gets taken away by the Lord from the eunuch. And, and when I, I remember when I first read this, I, I was around the age of 10, and I had to read it over and over and over. Because can you imagine this? You're, the, the, Philip and the eunuch are talking, and then all of a sudden, Philip's gone. But what did the eunuch do? The eunuch like, oh, we got to turn back and go talk to, go find Philip. No. It said he continued on his way rejoicing because he had found a savior who loved him. And next Sabbath, we're gonna do something a little different. Next Sabbath, we are gonna go through the story, but through the eyes of the Ethiopian. What was it about the gospel that changed his life? But today I want us to look at one, I want us, I want to close with one thing that God has a plan for each and every one of us. And God is asking for us to go. He says, go and make disciples. All of us have the exact same mission. Is that to tell the world that Jesus Christ came to this earth, he died for us, and he's in heaven, and he's coming back soon. And I would just like to challenge you. If you feel like you're in your comfort zone, if you feel God has been telling you to go, but you've been hesitant, now is the time to go. Because in a few weeks, we are going to have an evangelistic series, aren't we? And I believe outside these doors, our friends, our neighbors, they need to know about Jesus. Because Jesus is coming so soon. And I want to I invite you. I don't want to challenge you. I want to invite you. If God is talking to you today and saying, there's so-and-so, there's something I need you to do, to not be hesitant, to not be scared, but as a body of Christ, for us to join together and for us to go and follow Jesus Christ and lead this city, lead our friends, lead our family to Jesus. So with this, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, our God, Lord, we praise you because, Lord, you are in control. Lord, you are working on people's hearts even before we meet them. And Lord God, you give us the privilege to go to follow after you. And Lord God, I just pray that this afternoon, this Sabbath, if there's any of us here who have things in our lives that is keeping us from going, that is keeping us in our comfort zone, that Lord, you'll take them away. And may as the Cleburne First Church, as your body, Lord, may we tell the world about your good news. May we go where you want us to go. We love you, Lord, and thank you for loving us. In your name I pray, amen.